Thank you very much, and especially for this invitation. And, and it's wonderful to be in the company of architects and, and people who have devoted themselves to the history of the car. I owe much in writing um, car wars to conversations with traffic engineers, specialists, activists and so on, and I'm hoping to learn more again today. For almost a century, Australia has, earned, has enjoyed a long love affair with the car. When I was a boy, we used to say that Australia rode on the, back, on the sheep's back, but I think we could just as well say that it rode in the cabin of a Holden Ute. The car transformed the ways in which we thought and lived. Making cars provided hundreds of thousands of Australians, including many immigrants, with good livelihoods. The automobile, with its promise of freedom, opportunity and prosperity, became the most potent symbol of the social and cultural paradigm that we often encapsulate in the word modernity. To be modern, writes Marshall Berman in a famous passage, is to be in an environment that promises us adventure, power, joy, growth, transformation of ourselves and of the world, and at the same time threatens to destroy everything we have, everything we know, everything we are. When Berman wrote those words in 1983, he was thinking mostly of the threat of nuclear war. But when we read them now, it's the threat of global extinction through man-made climate change that probably leaps first to our minds. For much of the 20th century, Australians were bit players in the drama of automobilisation, eager consumers of cars designed and built elsewhere, as they are still. Only occasionally, as for example in the 1960s and 70s when Jack Brabham and Ron Toronac uh, uh, rose to prominence, and, and, and Toronac, who we honour in this lecture, when they combined their talents to win the Formula One championship, Australia uh, came into the international spotlight. There are, of course, still Australian drivers winning uh, Formula One races. There are Australian engineers and entrepreneurs making components for the global automobile industry. And the occasional Australian, like Jack Nasser, makes it big in the international corporate world of the motor car as well. But with the closure of the Holden and Ford and Toyota plants, it seems for many of us that the best days of the Australian car industry are behind us. So we look back on those years with a sense of nostalgia, mixed perhaps with anxiety about the hard choices that our long dependence on the car has now created for us. Sometimes people ask me as a historian when I expect our work to be done. Surely by now they say the army of Australian historians must have covered every conceivable period and topic in Australia's past. But of course, fortunately for us, the historian's work is never done if only because the questions that we ask about the past keep changing. In the early 21st century, I think that the questions that we ask now about the car are different from those that we asked 20, 30 or 40 years ago. Even in the decade or so since I wrote Car Wars, I find that I'm asking questions in a different way. Do you remember Hegel's famous remark, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, or to translate the German philosopher into everyday language, it's only when a culture is passing away that we can truly grasp its significance. The 19th century was the great age of steam. Our century appears to be the digital age. While the 20th century, which witnessed many of the great technological developments of our time, was preeminently, I think, the age of the automobile. And as they become superseded, the design paradigms that sustained us for most of those 50, 60 or 100 years, the Fordist system of assembly line production and its cousins, the urban freeway, the motel, the drive-in cinema, the drive-in bottle shop, uh, the low density suburb with its sprawling owner occupied houses, that all of those distinctive character characteristics of that way of life are thrown into sharper relief. Histories of the car like most other histories, tend to fall into one or another distinctive shape, or what we might sometimes historians call master narratives or meta narratives. For a long, long while, that story looked like a success story, a narrative of progressive technological improvement, material comfort, and human advancement. In his recent brilliant book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, the economic historian Robert J. Gordon places the advent and development of the automobile at the very centre of his explanation 
of why the middle 20th century delivered unparalleled and widely shared prosperity to the American people, and one might I add to many other countries as well. Neither the first industrial revolution of the late 18th and 19th, early 19th century, nor, he argues, the digital revolution of our own times, will, has delivered the benefits of economic growth on the same scale or as to many people as did the age of the automobile. That great leap forward, to use Gordon's phrase, seems both unprecedented and unlikely to be repeated. In its heyday, the car inspired visions of a world of limitless mobility. One of the most enthusiastic Australian prophets of the new age was the early 20th century journalist, planner, aviator, wireless enthusiast, uh, George Taylor. Modern times are especially reflective of the human tendency to progress, he wrote. This perpetual forward motion is common to every sphere of life, domestic, commercial, artistic and scientific. In his well-known book, Los Angeles, The Architecture of Four Ecologies, the critic Rainer Bannum memorably dubbed the, this imagined world of perpetual forward motion, Autopia, the word that we use in the title of this conference. A, no, a word uh, no sooner coined with playful intent by Rainer Bannum than Disney made it real in his American playground, Disneyland. Autopia may be a fantasy, but it has a tenacious hold on our imagination. As I remarked in Car Wars, if cars were worshipped, it was in part because they delivered real benefits and enlarged people's lives in highly valued ways. The freedoms that came with the car were real freedoms. They can only be understood if we first appreciate the more limited and regulated world from which the car delivered us. If we are to understand the appeal of modernism, we first need to think ourselves back into the constrained post-war world of petrol rationing, run-down and overcrowded public transport, muddy heartbreak streets and weary housewives lugging their shopping home in buggies and string bags. Right from the beginning, of course, there were those of course, on the other side who viewed the car as a disaster and its unstoppable progress as a road to ruin. What looked like life-enhancing freedom from the driver's seat could look more threatening to those on the curb or ha who happened to be caught in the path of the car itself. One of the first people to, well, this is the white, these, these are versions, if you like, of the vision of, and I want to go back, yeah, well, let me see again. Oh, you can't go back? I haven't ordered my slides properly. Never mind, we'll go back in a minute. Right from the beginning, those who viewed the arrival of the car as a disaster, one of the first to sound the alarm in the most amusing day way was the writer Kenneth Graham in his wonderful children's story, Wind in the Willows. Wind in the Willows was published in 1902, the same year as saw the passage of the British Motor Car Act, or the English Motor Car Act. And the story's most memorable character, Mr. Toad, personifies the mixture of innocent pleasure and lethal danger that the pioneer motorist represented. Intoxicated by the freedom of the road, Toad is contemptuous of everyone and everything in his rampaging way. He has only to start his car's engine and he's rapturously transported. As the familiar sound broke forth, I'm re reading from Kenneth Graham, as the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him body and soul. As if in a dream he found himself somewhere seated in the driver's seat, as if in a dream he pulled the lever and swung the car out around the yard and out through the archway, and as if in a dream all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was towed once more, towed at his best and highest, towed the terror, towed the tra traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. When Toad crashes his car, squanders his inheritance and gets into trouble with the police, his friends extract a promise not to touch the motor car again. But his penitence is only momentary. Then you don't promise, said Badger, never to touch the motor car again. Certainly not, replied Toad emphatically. On the contrary, I faithfully promise that the very first motor car I see, boop, boop, off I go in it. Over the course of the 20th century, as cities became more congested, the toll of death on the roads increased, and especially from the 1970, 
as the twin threats of peak oil and carbon pollution loomed larger, visions of the automobile itself became bleaker. Australian filmmakers uh, like uh, George Miller and, P and Peter Weir, uh, George Miller, as you might know, in his youth had, as a doctor had seen the results of road carnage as a doctor in the emergency ward at St Vincent's uh, Hospital. And he produced the ap apocalyptic road movie Mad Max, while Peter Weir gave us the weirdly dystopic cars that aid Paris. As I should also mention, in fairness, that also gave us um, some movies, wonderful movies, that celebrate the car, like the FJ Holden, The Big Steel, and, and one that I think is still my favourite Australian uh, motor car movie, Ray Argyle's uh, Beautiful Return Home. There's now a small library of books expounding or analysing what one writer calls autopia. A fear or hatred of cars almost as excessive and irrational as the autophilia of its admirers. Piles of battered car bodies like the carnage from some technological plague decorate their lurid covers. And I think these were the images that I wanted to show you before, or this sort of thing. Autopia, autophobia comes in as many versions as there are reasons for fearing or hating cars. Marxist, environmentalist, sentimental, te technophobic. One of the first anti-car writers was a Soviet propagandist, er Ilya Ehrenberg, whose 1929 novel The Life of the Automobile portrays the car as an agent of American imperialism. Ford is everywhere, he writes. The automobile has come to show even the slowest minds that the earth is truly round, that the heart is just a poetic relic, that a human being contains two standard gauges. One indicates miles, the other's minutes. It was still common in the 1960s and 70s to see mass automobilization as the product of a sinister conspiracy between American oil and car companies seeking to dominate the world by buying up and closing down the perfectly serviceable public transport systems, sending their emissaries around the world and seducing politicians and technocrats with free trips to Detroit. And there was, as I, I suspect, uh, an, an undeniable element of truth uh, in that story. In Car Wars, I tell, as Helen did this morning, the story about how pro-American businessmen like Kenneth and Bailey Meyer sponsored scholarships for young Australian engineers to study American techniques of highway design and traffic engineering at the Yale Summer Schools run by Wilbur Smith, who of course then becomes the leading consultant to the Australian Transport Authority including the Melbourne and Metropolitan Transport Study, which gave us that 1969 freeway plan for Melbourne. And I've also told the story that Helen revisited this morning of the 64 traffic conference and that encounter between Burton Marsh, an emissary of the American Automobile Association and an advocate for the American recipe of full automobilisation, and, and the gentlemanly British engineer Colin Buchanan. Who, and who I think in that conference really deferred to Burton Marsh. I mean, I think, I think he capitulated, in, in my view. So I, ought, I don't altogether discount the idea that there was a fair amount of hucksterism and see, sometimes a straight-out bribery in the way in which the car lobby won over politicians and officials. But during the 50s and 60s, when many of the critical decisions were made, the convenience and pleasure of motoring was so self-evident that most people needed little convincing. It was only when we got further down the path towards full automobilisation that the costs began to mount. And that's why in Car Wars I describe the motor car as being a kind of Faustian bargain. Like Dr Faustus, we're seduced into a way of thinking and organising our world whose consequences for, for evil as well as, as good we can only partly see. Narratives of the car in post-war Australia are now framed by the curve of its heroic rise and sad decline. Now I'll see if I can get, oh there's Mad Max. And there's Kenneth Graham, I'm sorry, I, and here's Mr Toad in two versions in illustrated books. <laughs> but I want to take you to this moment, which we might say, this, I, I think this is the foundational image, isn't it, of, of our narrative of, of what happened um, after the war. Here's Labor Prime Minister Ben Chifley standing rather stiffly among a handful of company men at the first FX, as the first FX Holden rolls off the production line at Fisherman's Bend. The Labor government had made zealous efforts, as you know, to generate a local car industry, even including a scheme to bring the British Roots Group to Bendigo. But within months, as we all know, Chifley was to be defeated at the polls by Bob Menzies' resurgent Liberals, who promised uh, to empty out the Socialists and fill the Bowsers by ending patrol rationing. 
in the famous bulletin cartoon, going my way in a full petrol tank, it's Menzies who's helping the voter into his Holden, while poor Ben Chifley stands disconsolately beside his old, or inside, isn't he, his old jalopy. There would be other ceremonies on the Holden production line. For example, when the company produced its millionth vehicle, oh, sorry, uh, but none as sad as that uh, last year, when the last locally made Holden rolled off the production line at Elizabeth. There were no politicians in attendance that day, although Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull sent his condolences. Jimmy Barnes, an old Elizabeth boy, sang working class man for the working men and women who would lose their jobs when the plant closed down. And there, you can see similar, this is the similar narrative for Falcon, just to make sure I'm not being... This is the launching of the first Falcon, a bit more razzmatazz than there was in 49. <laughs> and here's the end of, of Ford. So although its death had been long expected, the end of the local car industry produced some very strong responses. Anger and indignation from some who suspected, not without reason, that it had been sacrificed to the god of competition policy rather than succumbing to an inevitable demise. In his Penguin special, End of the Road, Gideon Haig notes that most countries with successful car industries offer various forms of protection and he asks, I think, why Australia felt compelled to remove the very modest levels of subsidy that remained. More common, especially among those who've been involved in the industry some way, is a sense of nostalgia. The rise and decline of the car industry has coincided more or less with the baby boomer generation. And responses to the decline of the car are mingled with that generation's complex accounting for the mixtures of guilt, luck, guilt and foreboding in their own lives. There's been a rush of books, films and exhibitions celebrating the history of the car in Australia. I got mixed up in some of this uh, myself. I co-wrote co some episodes of Paul Clark's ABC doco Wide Open Road, something that I put on these days on my resume with some hesitation. The narrative curve in my first drafts of the series is still vaguely recognisable in the final product. But along the way, it got uh, considerably changed. Uh, mangled is the word that I <laughs> comes to mind. Uh, by the old rev heads that Clark and his mates employed to tone up my rather too nuanced academic prose. <laughs> Not deterred by the experience, I also contributed to some prose to a thing I showed you before but I won't go back to, Simon Caterson's nice picture book, Behind the Wheel, and I'm to be a talking head in yet another doco on the rise and decline of the car industry, which I'm, I'm doing some shoots next week. More seriously, I've joined a team based in Adelaide and Monash conducting an oral history project on the history of Holden. The project's being generously funded as a linkage grant by the, the ARC and as a goodbye goodwill gesture by General Motors, but with the, interestingly with the participation of the union and a number of other interested groups. So after a bit of a gap, um, uh, uh, having written Car Wars and thinking I was taking leave of the subject, I'm now gearing up, as it were, to think more again about the motor car. And, um, and, and I'm trying to think about the mixtures of pride and sorrow and anger and nostalgia that one might bring to that subject. So, um, and I don't think, and since I don't think nostalgia is a good enough reason, um, I'm wanting to try and pursue that thought a bit in what remains of this lecture by telling you a little about, about first of all, I'm going to indulge a little nostalgia, if you will allow me, but then I want to move on and try and ask some questions about where I think uh, our understanding of the car might go. So uh, on, on the nostalgia, I, I, I realised that I'm not actually a baby boomer, I'm a pre-baby boomer, I'm probably the, old, I mean, I'm the oldest person in the room, I might be close to it. Um, so, um, uh, and I've therefore actually witnessed a good, a bit, good deal of this story myself. I've got visual evidence for this. So I want to take you first of all to this picture. This is me as a baby standing in the backyard of our house in Bankery Street, Essendon. It probably must about 1942 or 43, for in the background you can see my dad's car, a 1928 Essex in a makeshift garage. Notice I didn't say carport, a term that didn't arrive as far as I know in Australian English until after the 50s. And you can tell it's wartime because the mound of earth you see in the foreground is actually the roof of our air grade shelter. Remember we lived close to Essendon Airport, then an American Air Force base. And my dad, who is a plumber as well as a local air raid warden, has erected that tank you can see there as well, to ensure that we don't die of thirst if the Japanese bombers have destroyed our water supply. For much of the war, the Essex was put up on blocks as Dad cycled to work in the Maribyrnong uh, munitions factory. When peace came at last, he stripped it down and turned it into a ute by removing the rear seats and sliding a timber tray 
of his own design onto the back. I, don't, I wish I had a picture of that, I don't. I can still remember the joyous day when he drove it back from the shed at the back of my grandmother's house where he'd actually assembled the, the new vehicle. Now even then, Dad had his sights on a new car, but the dollar shortage meant that American cars and trucks, that have, which were really what Australians wanted, um, were in short supply. The only new ute on offer was a British Bedford. Now, Dad was the son of British immigrants, and he might therefore have been expected to have a preference for the British product, but he really didn't fancy this thing at all. The tray was too small and nobody much liked its boxy English style. One day in 1950, I was walking home from school down Buckley Street with my friend Morris Johnson. And like schoolboys everywhere, we liked to spot cars. Morris was the first to spot the sleek new cream Chevrolet ute. But I was the one to cry out in surprise when I saw my father at the wheel. If there was a moment when the Davisons became modern, this was it. The ute doubled as the workhorse for the family business and the family car. Mum and Dad sat in front across the bench seat with my little sister, while my older sister and I sat in one of the Essex old horsehair seats under a canvas hood. I think we must have part. These are friends. That, that's me, and, and, but these are friends, kids, and I think we must have piled them in somehow or other as well. With the caravan behind, it took us to the far corners of the strait. So that it took my junior cricket team to away matches. Mum long insisted that the Chev was the best car we ever owned. In 1950, you still couldn't get a Holden Ute or a station wagon. Later on, in the early 60s, after briefly trying a Ford mainline Ute, Dad purchased a Holden station wagon. He'd paid, as you can see here, this is the, the bill for the, whole, for the Chev, and you can see he paid just over £1,000 for a, that car in, uh, in the early 50s. But by the early 60s, you can see here's his, his, uh, his that, that's not his writing, it must have been the person who was the rep who sold him the Holden station wagon, and here you can see, it, for about half that price, by this, in, over that period his, his wages would have increased by at least 50%, and the price of the car has come down to half of what it was. Uh, not the same car, admittedly, but, but roughly the same. Mum never actually learned to drive, but by the time we kids left school, buying a car was high on our own agenda. My secondary teacher's scholarship not only paid all my university fees, but a stipend of seven pounds a week, which was enough to buy and maintain a second-hand car. I bought my first car, a 1948 Triumph Roadster from my uncle Jack McConnell. Jack was the secretary of the Victorian Liberal Party, and in the magnificent Triumph, he must have cut quite a dash as he toured the electorates during the 49 election, promising to throw out the socialists and fill up the Bowsers. By the time I bought it, in 19, uh, 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 for about £100, the canvas hood was torn and the beige duco was fading, but I repainted it in British racing green and bought a new hood. That's my little sister Jan, not my girlfriend, standing with the family dog outside our house. Powered by an old Vanguard wet sleeve engine, the Triumph belied its speedy looks. One evening I was driving my girlfriend to a friend's 21st birthday party in the hills when the brakes failed. Only the sudden and providential appearance of a runoff saved us from disaster. Word of the episode travelled back to the girl's father, who delivered an ultimatum. Get rid of that car or stop taking out my daughter. He kindly offered to intercede with a neighbour, a local used car dealer, who found me an excellent replacement, a one owner FJ Holden, which I later wrote off in a head-on collision on the way to uni from a teaching round. Now, well, any baby boomer, I'm sure, could tell a similar, a similar nostalgic story. Um, that, with that mixture of pleasure, opportunity, danger and disaster in their encounters with the car. Uh, so I think of the Morris Mini of our early married years, the sturdy Toyota station wagon of our kids' school days, the little Honda Civic I drove to Monash, and the Prius of our retirement years. These personal narratives have a place in the broader history of the car, for they reveal something of the powerful emotions that have shaped and still shape our memories and our encounters with it. But if our histories to escape the self-indulgence of nostalgia, they need broader bearings and some sharper questions. So I now want to turn to suggest some lines of thought and investigation that acknowledge the post-Fordist world in which we now find ourselves, yet also move beyond the unproductive binaries of autophilia and autophobia. This may require us to think more critically about the complex package that we call the automobile to recognise both its liberating and its confining effects, to acknowledge the ways in which we've learned to control it 
and the ways in which it and the fabric of ideas and institutions that are built up around it still in some measure control us. As its high noon passes, the voids created by its disappearance reveal the nature and extent of its power. The abandoned factories with their vacant car parks, the automobile dependent suburbs marooned from the new frontiers of opportunity, the aching void at the heart of a nation that only seems to dig things up and no longer make them. These are among the symptoms of a rift in our society and culture that we're still struggling to absorb. So we can approach that question from different angles and in the time that's left I'm going to offer some thoughts about three topics and I I'll hope I've got time to deal with them all. One is the place of the car, especially the Holden car, in the national imagination. The second is about the influence of the car upon social structure, and, and if you might say the class structure of Australia. And finally, since this conference is subtitled The Car in the Modern City, about the car and the changing structure of our cities. When the, car, when the Holden first rolled off the production line, the Australian car industry was already half a century old. But the decision of General Motors to manufacture a car designed for Australian conditions was a significant moment in our national life. For the first time there was to be a mass-produced car manufactured entirely in Australia and made at least so it was claimed for Australian conditions. The claim that Holden was Australia's own car, of course, was always a debatable one, since the company that made it was a wholly owned subsidiary of an American one. And while Australians were involved in its design, it remained an identifiable product of GM's international design stable. From the outset, GM recognised that it would need to persuade Australians to adopt the car as its own, or as their own. At the end of the war, Australians' attitudes towards the United States remained in many ways ambivalent. American troops and ships may have saved Australia from the Japanese, but many Australians still looked to England as the motherland and half resented American success and technical know-how. Aware of how public attitudes could influence their business, GM com commissioned Roy Morgan, who had acquired a franchise to conduct public opinion research from the Gallup organisation, to survey Australian attitudes towards America and towards their own company. They also surveyed the Australians for the features that Australia wanted in their car. And, and, and distilled what really became the Holton, the six-cylinder, five or six-passenger, bench seat, column gear shift, rugged lightweight construction, the characteristics that really were built into the Holton. In its publicity, the company shrewdly sought to reflect back the features that drivers identified as characteristically Australian. Early advertisements for the Holden display the Holden very often in typical bush se settings amidst flowering wattles, in country towns, in, on farms and sheep stations, and even on the top of the nation's highest mountain, Mount Kosciuszko. More rarely, and only usually from the 1960s, do they place it, uh, here's the holiday Holden, if you like, um, in beach and city and suburban settings. Sorry, this one. The image of the Holden as Australia's own car was something that GM methodically cultivated by a campaign that in method as well as substance was as modern as the manufacture of the car itself. One of my hopes is that with access to GM's own records, our project will be able to better understand how Holden was able to gradually win a place in the nation's heart so completely that when at last Detroit pulled the plug, its closure seemed more like an Australian failure than an American betrayal. Car wars, is largely about how the, the car, considered from a consumer's point of view, changed the city. And I realise now in retrospect, and perhaps with a, bit, a little penitently, that I devoted only about half a dozen pages in that book to the impact of the car on Melbourne's industrial geography, workforce and social structure. You can't cover everything, of course, in a book of that length, and reviewers hardly seem to notice my omission. But in retrospect, I think it was probably a serious one. I later co-wrote A History of Monash University, an institution intended by its founders to provide the scientific and technological know-how and training for a new region in the eastern part of Melbourne anchored by the automobile industry. Looking from the windows of the Ming Wing towards the sawtooth roofs of the Holden and Nissan plants, I began to see connections between the car plants and the campus that had previously eluded me. Places like Dandenong and Broadmeadows 
exhibited the integrated pattern of economic, industrial and cultural characteristics that we often ca encapsulate with the word Fordism. The key features of the paradigm may be briefly summarised. Large, I don't know, have I done that here? No, I haven't. Anyway. Large manufacturing plants located usually on greenfield sites on the urban periphery using Fordist production line technology. Secondly, the application of functional design and flow technology to many other features of industrial, domestic and social life. And thirdly, interventionist government action to foster the development of industry including tariff, housing, migration, planning and infrastructure policies. This is the pa kind of package that people like David Harvey characterise as being Fordist. By the 1960s, Melbourne, the Melbourne suburbs with the fastest rates of industrial growth were concentrated particularly on the western the city's northwestern and southeastern edges. This is the Volkswagen plant. Um, here's the. And this is gives you an eye. Those two darker areas, the one in the, to the north. This is in the 57 to 67 period. You can see how those two areas are opening up as major areas of industrial expansion. While both of those areas actually had access to rail, many of the new plants were located on greenfield sites and reliant on new forms of automobilised freight transport such as the semi-trailer and the forklift truck. Ford and Holden along with other American companies such as the agricultural machinery manufacturer and international harvesters and the food preserver H.J. Hines anchored suburbs that hosted a range of subsidiary industries. One of the most perceptive observers of these developments was the German-born photographer Wolfgang Sievers. Sievers' familiarity with the aesthetic principles of the Bauhaus and his respect for industrial technology enabled him to discern the inner logic as well as the functionalist aesthetic of the new industrial landscape. In stark black and white, he, represent, he shows us the sweeping lines, smooth sweeping lines of its architecture, the intimate communion between humans and machines and the ceaseless rapid motion of the production line. So here's Sievers and here's some of his photographs. You see how he's, he, he, with the, these blurred photographs, try and captures the sense of movement on the production line. These photographs inspire, I think, well, to me at least, enormous admiration, but also a, a certain sense of disquiet. Who are these workers apparently so silently and compliantly wedded to their machines? Are they happy or sad? Willing workers or dumb industrial slaves? Were the immigrants who supplied much of their labour force on the bottom rung of a ladder of opportunity? Or were they, in a word often used at the time, simply factory fodder for greedy American capitalists? In 1973, I was here at the University of Melbourne teaching a fourth year honours course on the history of post-war migration, when the workers at the, at the Ford Broad Meadows factory, led by militant trade unionists, embarked on what turned out to be a nine-week strike. And, when the, and there was a good deal of violence in, involved in that as well. One of my students, John O'Hara, who later became a TV producer, went out to interview them. The unions had many... I'm oh, sorry, um, these are... These are here's the migrant workers and the nearby uh, migrant hostels, which were part of the package, and here's the Ford strike. Uh, the unions had many grievances. Low pay, bad working conditions, insensitive and humiliating treatment by English-speaking supervisors. Working on the production line, it dominates your life, one worker complained. You simply can't afford to get behind. According to a Turkish member of the strike committee, Ford was absorbing migrant, migrant blood and making millions. Fifty years on, with the great car plants now abandoned, many of those workers, many of those workers who felt aggrieved in 1973, look back on the glory days of the car industry. Recently I read, these are further scenes from that strike. Recently I read this interesting book, An Economy is Not a Society, written by a former graduate of my own department, the historian and novelist Neville Dennis Glover. Glover grew up as the son of British immigrants in Doveton, the housing commission suburb built to supply housing for the nearby Holden plant in Dandenong. He later took a history degree at Monash and a doctorate in Cambridge and became a speechwriter for Labour politicians. He looks back fondly on his childhood in Doveton, a working class community which offered secure, relative, relatively well-paid employment for both his parents, 
decent public housing and state education. Mark Peel, another son of British immigrants, presents a rather similar picture of Elizabeth, another General Motors town, in his fine history, Good Times, Hard Times. Now perhaps you'll say that Glover and Peel, who escaped to successful academic careers, Peel, by the way, has just stepped down as provost of uh, the University of Leicester in the, back in the UK, that you might say that they have a rosier view of these places than other less successful children of migrants. If you want a bleaker view of what it was like to live in Elizabeth, I suggest you read Jimmy Barnes' brilliant autobiography, Working Class Boys, one of the most extraordinary accounts of boyhood I think I've ever read. But Glover's picture of Doveton accords pretty well with the accounts of contemporary sociologists who studied Doveton in the 1970s in their book, An Australian Newtown. Looking back, Glover and Peel, both avowed leftists, see much to admire in the Fordist compact of capitalist manufacturing and state-provided tariff protection, transport, housing, education and social welfare. And much to lament in the neoliberal revolution that has swept it all away. What the striking workers of 1973 saw as capitalist oppression, we may now see as something much more benign. New immigrants still come to Australia, but from different sources and with different means. The skilled migrants who come, often from Asia, with tertiary education uh, qualifications, either in prospect or already under their belt, are readily absorbed into the post-Fordist economy of professional and service occupations. But those like refugees from sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East may well these days still end up in places like Doveton, Broadmeadows or Elizabeth, where the cheaper there's still cheaper housing, but no longer the factory jobs, public housing or state-provided services that made them habitable to a previous generation. The decline of manufacturing, exemplified by the car industry, has also contributed to the phenomenon the economist Bob Gregory calls the disappearing middle, the disappearance of that layer of skilled and semi-skilled manual occupations which contributed, so he argues, to Australia's democratic ethos. If, if Australia has now become a more unequal society, it is in part because of the shrinkage of industries like the car industry which actually supported that skilled uh, and semi-skilled working class. Let me turn finally to my third theme, the effects of the rise and relative decline of the car on the changing shape of our cities. In 1951, social researchers employed by the Board of Works, then Melbourne's main planning authority, conducted a survey of people's transport habits and resi residential preferences. This was background to that 54 plan that Helen was referring to. And they asked people two questions, where do you want to move from and where do you want to move to? And as you can see from these maps, overwhelmingly, they wanted to move out of the inner city and to the suburbs. Some of the places they hoped to move to were well serviced by public transport. There was some spare capacity in the excellent train and tram systems that Melbourne had inherited from the colonial period. In that year, public transport was still the same main way in which people got to work. So look at the bar graph in the lower part. Um, this, is, this will contrast with where we are now. Um, but you can see in that almost as many people walked or rode a bike to work as travelled by car in 1951. Some autophobes think that the car created the demand for suburban living. But Melbourne had been suburbanising for over a century. The car was just the apparently heaven sent means for a new generation to enjoy it. The 54 Melbourne planning scheme forecast that the city would expand rapidly, especially to the southeast, along its existing travel corridors, with only modest additions to the public transport network and more rapid increases in the volume of traffic, but still in an essentially radial pattern. By the 1960s, suburban development was breaking free of the old public transport network, and the highest rates of home, home ownership, a uh, car ownership, I'm sorry, were concentrated in a belt of low density southeastern suburbs stretching from Oakley to Mount Waverley and from Moorabbin to Doncaster, the, the zone which I call uh, the cream brick frontier. I might just quickly go back for a moment and show you this map. This, this is quite interesting because, again, this maps the phases of growth. And what you can see, quickly see from this is that uh, up to the, the darker green, you can see that most of the, the development is still confined within the corridors that were established by the public transport system. And then thereafter, you can see by the lighter green and the, and the beige colour how it expands way beyond the confines of the old public transport system. 
Between the rows of cream brick houses with their drives and carports, there was springing up a new kind of drive-in landscape, inspired by the same Fordist logic as shaped the car plants where many of their residents spent their working days. This was the land of the used car lot, the service station, the drive-in bottle shop, the beer barn, the drive-in cinema and the motel. Plot them on a map and they form a roughly north-south uh, line between Blackburn and Springvale roads um, on the axis from east to west and, and between uh, Burwood Highway and Dandenong Road. This is the zone where you, you probably can't read all of those labels, I'm sorry, but I'll take you to some of them. The Oakley Motel, which was Melbourne's first, was opened in 1957 just near where the Olympic marathon runners had turned and headed back to the MCG just a few months before. The entrepreneur who established it had rather hoped to capitalise on that, but he got there a bit too late. Made various pleas to Henry Bolte to give him some money and Henry Bolte passed it on to Arthur Fadden and Arthur Fadden so, said no sorry, um, but he got there eventually. The Metro Drive-In, uh, oh sorry, these are a few more shots of the, this is Robert Boyd's of course take on the, the motel when he described uh, what he called Hysterica. I don't think he was, Rainer Banham I realise coined Autopia after um, Robert Boyd talked about Hysterica. But this is the interior of the Oakley Motel where you could get chicken Maryland and all sorts of other interesting American <laughs> delicacies. Um, here's the Burvale uh, Drive-In Hotel. A bit, a, a bit later. Here's the Clayton Drive-In. Uh, I think uh, Philip's going to tell us about, a bit more about drive-ins later. But this was just a bit further along um, on the corner of Wellington Road and Blackburn Road. It's now the site of the synchrotron. The Burvale, the most striking of the new drive-in hotels, was strategically located on the corner of Springvale Road and Burwood Highway. The project builder A.V. Jennings, who applied the lessons of Ford's production to the housing industry, also took the first step towards drive-in shopping when he built Pinewood as part of his new housing development on Blackburn Road. When the Meyer brothers, uh, Kenneth and Bailey Meyer, failed to convince the company's board to build a shopping centre on land that they'd purchased themselves on the corner of Blackburn Road and Burwood Highway, they sold the land off to Coles, who established here the first Kmart. Mart. Meyer later hired American consultants who mapped the distribution of car ownership in the eastern suburbs before recommending a new regional shopping centre cl as close as possible to the junction of Warrigal and Springvale Roads. I might quit, just indulge myself for a moment and go back. That, that service station is actually on the op uh, diagonally opposite on the corner of Springvale Roads and Warrigal Roads and the, um, the baby who you see being held by the proprietor is my PhD supervisor, Dr. Barry, Barry Smith, <laughs> he grew up there. Um, so taking you on to it here, to Chadston. Chadston, now uh, the nation's largest mall, was consciously designed around the car. It included a driving school so housewives could qualify for a <laughs> licence and angled parking so that they avoided embarrassing confrontations with other shoppers. Monash, Australia's first drive-in university, was established about the same time. Oh, here's, here's Nicky, you know, three years Ed's Nicky, used to run the women's program. Here he is in the special uh, broadcasting studio at, and of course they included an auditorium and also a bowling alley, all sorts of other things which were later done away with, I'm afraid. Here's Monash University, um, established around 1960s, founders had tried unsuccessfully to acquire a site on a major public transport route but had to settle for one about a kilometre and a half from the rail but with a promise yet to be fulfilled that it would be connected by a branch line. Monash applied the same Fordist logic that had shaped the car plants and the drive-ins to the business of higher education. So here's some shots of the infant Monash campus. Here you can see the modernist architecture with one of its key features of course which is the surrounding car parks. It looks as though at that stage the average academic could stretch to a Volkswagen or a, an Anglia but nothing much better. And here um, uh, linking the floors of its most prominent landmark, the nine-storey Menzies building is a series of escalators. I like to think of them as a kind of academic conveyor belt, drawing in raw high school talent and turning out well-trained graduates. In the 60s it looked very much as though the cream brick frontier would become the city's favourite place to live. The region already boasted among the highest per capita incomes in the city. Oh, sorry, these are more Sievers photographs of 
Monash now, and you can see how the same approach is applied here to the science laboratories as he applied to the factories. Um, uh, I thought I'd brought it. Here, here we go. Um, the belief that the frontier would continue to expand, that its residents would grow ever more prosperous, was doomed, however, to disappointment. So here you can see, in 64, by medium income, the darker areas include those areas that were right out in the region that I've just been describing. Already, however, by the 70s, the drift of population back to the centre had begun to gain momentum. And now, if you map the distribution of high-income households in Melbourne, you find that the metropolis has almost turned itself inside out. In the 60s, a social researcher who sought to map the most livable suburbs in Melbourne oh. um, might have looked to the area with the biggest houses and gardens, the biggest shopping centres and playing fields and the best road system. When the age maps Melbourne's most livable suburbs today, what it looks for is not freeways and shopping centres, but parks and cafes, not automobility, but walkability. And it finds, predictably, that the most livable suburbs are concentrated around the city's rich endowment of pre-automobile buildings and infrastructure. Meanwhile, the cream brick frontier, once seen as a frontier of opportunity, looks more and more like a danger zone. Researchers at Griffith University have ranked Australian suburbs on their fearsome sounding vampire index, which measures their vulnerability to the twin hazards of automobile dependence and mortgage stress. And as you can see here, uh, the red zones are all on the edge rather than at the centre. With the hindsight of this great reversal, we may be inclined to look back on the history of Utopia with mixed feelings. Was it a nice ride while it lasted or a great mistake? Should we now erect a mental wrong, wrong way go back sign and attempt to retrace our way towards the compact, well integrated European style city that we might have been if the automobile had not seduced us? with its beguiling promise of adventure, power, joy, growth, transformation of ourselves and the world. These, perhaps, are questions which we'll return in the course of the day. But in conclusion, I'd just like to offer a few cautionary thoughts. First, while one should never flinch from whatever lessons history may have for us, I'm reluctant to see the era of, or the heyday of the car as a great mistake. The gains it brought in human living standards and social opportunity were real and significant, perhaps the greatest leap forward in the history of the world. And if they couldn't be sustained for the long run, perhaps we should not be too regretful, for as J.M. Keynes famously remarked, in the long run we are all dead. Second, we should not underestimate the enduring appeal of automobility or its amazing powers of recuperation. When we look back over the past 60 years of mass automobilisation, many of the hazards that threatened its progress have actually been ameliorated, if not overcome. The truly horrendous loss of life through traffic accidents in the 1950s was substantially cut by a combination of better designed roads and vehicles and intelligent regulation, such as the blood alcohol and seatbelt laws which Australia largely pioneered. In the 1960s, planners predicted that without 300 miles of new freeways, Melbourne's traffic congestion would bring the city to a halt. In fact, only a fraction of that system was actually built, and yet the city didn't grind to a halt, thanks largely to the little heralded efforts of traffic engineers to manage the existing road system much more efficiently. Although some observers might now say that con congestion has now reached intolerable limits. The truth, of course, is that congestion is an inevitable and necessary feature of any traffic system. Meanwhile, Autopians imagine a future in which electric autonomous vehicles managed by ride-sharing technologies will overcome the environmental dangers that now block its path. I'm not as optimistic as they are, for I suspect that the shift in attitudes towards the car that is now underway is not simply a response to environmental hazards, but part of a more general questioning of the social benefits of unrestrained mobility. Almost as fanciful as the Autopians' vision of a city of limitless mobility is the now fashionable planning ideal of a 20-minute city in which everyone can find everything they want, jobs, shopping, education, medical care, cafes, concerts, in a 20-minute walk or a bicycle ride. It is a worthwhile aspiration, as long as its advocates don't think that wishing it will actually bring it true. For in our highly complex, ramified kind of city, uh, we need a, a, a modicum of mobility. Digital technologies will ease some forms of communication but the evidence so far is that the kind of complex and flexible division of labour it stimulates 
actually increases our need for face-to-face -face communication. So my hunch, for what it's worth, is that automobility in some form or other will be with us for some time yet, probably in combination with a range of other forms of, com of com sorry, communication and transport. And I haven't, by the way, even mentioned goods transport, which is a very, very important topic. We may feel with some justification that we have a, had a good run with the car, put a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, and it is now time to behave ourselves and go easier on the planet. But elsewhere I fear the automobile age has only just begun. And as this cartoon nicely suggests, as soon as we get out of the driver's seat, millions of others will be ready and willing to take our place. Thank you. <laughs>